Hey everyone, my name is Chris Johnson and I'm the Midtown Campus Pastor here at Crosswalk and we're just glad to have all of you here with us today. Today we're going to be continuing with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas as we take a look at the book of Acts in Acts chapter 14 and take a look at the missionary journey that they were on. And today we're going to be talking about amazing results. Now, I want to start out today, since this is Independence Day weekend, by asking you, what do you enjoy the most about the 4th of July? Is it the fireworks? Is it the family? Is it time with friends, maybe going and boating or grilling out or whatever it is? But the reality is that what I enjoy the most and what I like the most about this celebration at this time of the year is the focus on God's goodness that we really do have it good here in the United States of America. I mean, where else can you have a pizza arrive at your door faster than an ambulance? Where else are we so prone to park our cars in our driveways, and our cars are worth thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars, because we have so much stuff that we can't park them in the garage? Wow. God has indeed been very good to us. And that is despite all of the challenges that we face as a nation right now, whether it is the, the incredible gas prices, whether it's the, the food costs, whether it's the, the discussions that we're having over racial issues or over gender issues or the Roe v. Wade discussion. Uh, and, and so it just continues, right? But here's the thing. God is good. And he desires to bless us. And that's why I love celebrating this Independence Day weekend. But here's the thing. As it says in, in Lee Greenwood's song, which is one of my favorites, uh, God Bless the USA, one of the lines that he has in there is, I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men and women who died, who gave that right to me. I love that song for a lot of reasons. But maybe chief of which is the reminder that our freedom, what we enjoy here in the United States of America, is not free. It came at a cost. It reminds us that with great freedom comes great responsibility. Or maybe another way to put it is that we have an opportunity to be able to live out a life that makes a difference in the lives of others, just like the people before us. That, that's why we enjoy this great nation. And that also pertains to our faith life and our faith journey too. And so the big question that we have for today is this, what does God's version of a successful life look like? Now at face value, we may think, well, it's to live the American dream, right? It's all about that, that we can achieve our dreams and we can do whatever we want as long as we apply ourselves to it. And I think the reality with that is that God desires so much more than just living the American dream. God desires that we live his dream. And so what does that look like, God's version of a successful life? Well, to answer that, we're going to be diving into Acts chapter 14 today as we continue in this verse-by-verse -verse look at the book of Acts. And as we continue with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, we're going to see that God defines for us what a successful life looks like. And we're going to actually meet up with them today in the city of Derby. Now, as you take a look at the map, you're going to see that Derby was located about 60 miles straight east from the city of Lystra, where last week we found out that that was where Paul was stoned and left for dead. And so you want to talk about success? Paul at that point was probably thinking, yeah, that was not the greatest trip, you know? And I can only imagine that that 60-mile journey from Lystra to Derby probably wasn't all that pleasant for him. He probably had a whopping headache, just saying. And if not, also had a concussion awful bruises on his body. I mean, I don't know when the last time was that you had a bunch of rocks thrown at you, but your body doesn't usually fare too well with that. So that was a difficult journey for him. And you might be led to think, well, okay, well, since he was stoned for talking about Jesus, that maybe at the next city he was just going to kind of be quiet about it. Nope. Let's take a look at Acts 14, verse 21. It says, they preached the gospel in that city, so in Derby. 
and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Now, what's interesting as we take a look at this, that we might be tempted to think that what is truly the reason to celebrate here or the true amazing results that we would want to be focusing on here is the number of disciples that were won in Derby. But actually, it starts before that, doesn't it? That God defines success not by how many people are won for Jesus, but by how often we get to talk about Jesus with others. And so let's take a look at uh, this first fill in that God's version of success often is different from ours. Let's be honest, we live in such a numbers-driven society that it's all about the bottom line, right? So companies are measured based on their net worth. People are measured based on their net worth in, in Forbes magazine, right? Who, who are the billionaires? Who are the millionaires? And so on. And the reality is that God's version of success is very different than ours. And that is so true in the next part of this fill-in, that God's version of success is not necessarily the number of conversions, but the number of gospel conversations. Now, I'm just going to tell you that this is a, a little bit of a difficult one for me as a pastor, because as a home missionary in the Midtown area in Phoenix, guess what? I'm submitting monthly reports every, every single month to our board for home missions, uh, to letting them know what's going on. So how many people are being converted? How many people are being baptized? How many people are coming to faith? How many people are attending? And so on. But do you realize that one of the questions that's in that report is, how many gospel conversations are you having? You see, this makes a difference because lest we forget, that's how the Holy Spirit works. He works through his word in both the gospel and in the sacraments. And so that's how he brings people to faith. And so we need to understand that every conversation that we get to have about Jesus with someone is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work in that person's heart. And so this is actually a challenge to you and to me how many gospel conversations are we having? How often do we talk about Jesus with other people, whether it's family, friends, coworkers, neighbors, and so on? I'm going to tell you that this is challenging me. I want to rethink how many gospel conversations am I having each week? And I can up it so that the Holy Spirit has opportunities to create faith. And it just leads me to think, uh, let me just kind of give you an example of this. Uh, uh, there's a, a gentleman here at Crosswalk. I love talking with him. He's a great guy. And he talks in his life in terms of BC and AC. No, it's not ACDC. I'm sorry. I couldn't, I couldn't help that, right? But it's BC and AC. So he talks in terms of his life as before Christ and after conversion. And so when he describes his life before Jesus, he describes it in terms of lost, lonely, ashamed, um, hopeless, and restless. And after he met his wife and they talked about Jesus and, and she brought conversations about Jesus into his life, then he, he describes his life as after conversion. And you want to know the words that he uses? Found, forgiven, hopeful, a new identity in Jesus that his life is not defined by his sin, but is defined by his Savior. That he has a new destiny. He's no longer destined for hell, which is what he deserves and you and I deserve, but he's destined for heaven because of what Jesus has done for him. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's what Paul and Barnabas had the privilege of preaching and sharing but here's the next version of a successful life that God wants to, to give us, and that's this. God's version of success is not how great we are, but how graced we are. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, sometimes we think that, well, to be a great Christian, that we need to have our life in, in just in, in complete order, that we can do no wrong, that we're just the greatest example, and, and so on. 
but we're setting ourselves up for failure with that, aren't we? So often we define our life by how good we are, and yet what God wants us to know is it's all about grace. It's all about what God has done for us. And that's why I think that the practical application here is we take a look at the second half of verse 21 again. It says, Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. That Greek word for strengthen actually literally means to be firm right beside someone. And the word for encourage means to make a call to someone from right beside that person. And so again, the whole point is, is that we're close. We're within community with each other to care for one another. And so that's that community of grace that God has called us to be a part of. We're graced. You don't have to be great. We're graced to be able to strengthen and encourage each other. And that's important because as Paul says here, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. The reality is life can get pretty discouraging. Tell me, have you been discouraged by the gas prices? Have you been discouraged by um, people just saying, hey, you know what? Why are you believing in that Jesus guy? What, what's the deal? Have you been discouraged by people pushing back on you on how you live your life uh, trying to be moral? Well, the reality is, is that there are a lot of hardships and that's why we need each other. We need to be in community with each other. And, and here at Crosswalk, we have a lot of opportunities to do that. We have our peer connection ministry where you can have a one-to-one -one conversation with people. We, we have our groups where we're able to gather together for mutual encouragement, where we can be honest with each other, have honest conversations, and to encourage one another in our faith journey. We have our ministry teams where we're able to serve together and to make a difference together. You see, you can't actually carry this out of strengthening and encouraging one another and showing grace to one another without being in community with each other. You know, sometimes we pride ourselves in independence. After all, it's Independent Weekend, right? Independence Day weekend. But the reality is, is that there's greater joy when we are dependent on God and interdependent inter with each other. Now, what does that look like? Well, notice here in verse 23, they continue. It says, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church. That'd be like leaders, uh, pastors and teachers in each church. And with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. And so at each of these cities where they had previously started a church, uh, that they had the opportunity to bring the gospel to them, notice that Paul wanted to make sure that there were leaders taking care of those people. And, and here's the thing that we need to understand, that God's version of success for church leaders is upward reliance that leads to outward results. You know, sometimes uh, I, I can remember the conversation when I first got here that Pastor Jeff and Pastor Dan, every once in a while, they would tell each other, take off the cape. And, and sometimes they've had to say that to me too, take off the cape. And, and the whole point is, I am not your savior. You are not my savior. Pastor Dan isn't my savior. Although sometimes he may think he is. No, I'm just kidding. But here's the thing. There's only one savior and it's Jesus. So take off the cape. You see, the key to being a good spiritual leader is to be upward reliant upon our God. And as we do, Jesus says, hey, all you need to do is abide with me and then you're going to bear much fruit, right? He says that in John chapter 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Just focus on me and then you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so the key is that upward reliance that leads to outward results. And what are some of those results? Well, notice they talk about prayer here. And that Greek word for prayer literally means to take my will and allow it to be God's will. That when I pray, I'm praying, God, your will be done. And his will is as we seek to live out our love for him who first loved us. And notice that that then creates ripple effects. So Paul and Barnabas appointed these elders. They took care of their people and then they cared for others. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still talking about Jesus. Do you think that method works? Sure does. 
And so again, remember, upward reliance leads to outward results. Trust in the one who came for you to save you. Now, if we look at verse 26, it says, From Atalia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Now, what I love about this is that they're focusing here not on all that they had done, but all that God had done through them. That was the report. And this is our, our next uh, thought here, our next fill-in. The success of our spiritual journey begins and ends with what God has done for us. Just think about that. My being here is an act of God's grace. I don't deserve to be here, and neither do you. God is the one who moved first. God is the one who sent Jesus to be our Savior. And, you know, I mentioned it before that with great freedom comes great responsibility. Well, with great success comes great sacrifice. The success in my spiritual journey came from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for me. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 10, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's how I get right with God. That's how I have success in my faith journey. It's all about what God did for me through Jesus. It's like having a stain on my shirt that I can't get out. You know, the, the Tide Pods, nope, not going to get it out. The only, the only way that that stain is going to be removed is through the blood of Jesus. That he earned my forgiveness completely and your forgiveness completely through his sacrifice. And, and what's interesting is that his death looked like a failure. It looked like an epic failure. There were only like 120 people following Jesus by the time he ended his ministry. And then he was crucified by the religious leaders. By all outward appearances, it looked like his life was a complete failure. But it wasn't. Because through his resurrection, he achieved ultimate success in our salvation. And here we are 2,000 years later, still talking about it, because every generation of every person ever since Jesus, we continue to do our part in sharing the gospel. And that's our, our final thought here, that we all have a role to play in the spiritual success of others. This is why here at Crosswalk, we talk so much about the five purposes of the church, of worship, fellowship, service, discipleship, and outreach. All five purposes, as we live those out in our lives, are a way for us to be able to bring other people along in our spiritual journey. Because here's the thing, newsflash, worship is not just this one hour out of the week or this 20 minutes, 25 minutes, however long we're going to be together today. It's so much more than that. It's a whole life of worship. Our fellowship Again, it's all about those one another verses in the Bible, that there are like over 100 verses in the Bible that talk about being together and loving one another, praying for one another, encouraging one another, and so on. Service is all about serving one another because Jesus first served us. And there's great joy and fulfillment in that. Discipleship is all about growing my faith so that I'm able to strengthen and encourage others with the words and promises of God. The more that I know what God tells me, the more I'm able to share it with others. And then the final one of outreach. At the end of the day, it's all about us being able to share the good news of Jesus with the next generation. To fight for it. To sacrifice for it. To selflessly serve others for it all because Jesus did for us. So on this 4th of July weekend, I pray that God continues to richly bless you as you celebrate our nation's birthday, as you celebra celebrate his goodness to you. But remember, our freedom isn't free. Remember, our independence doesn't mean that we get to be free from God, but rather that we are dependent upon God is we're independent and interdependent with others to serve them. God bless you. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. 
Lord Jesus, thank you for the reminder through these words that we need to be reliant upon you. That as we celebrate Independence Day as a nation this weekend, that we need to be dependent upon you. That we don't ever want to be independent from you to think, oh, well, I'm just going to live my life my way. No, Lord, help us to be completely upward reliant upon you so that in turn we can be filled by you to live out the five purposes of the church, to worship, to fellowship, to serve, to disciple, and then to reach out to others. And so bless our celebration, Lord, and ultimately our celebration of your goodness. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Independence has never been easy. Nearly 250 years ago, it was something worth fighting for. The idea of a people who stood on equal footing, free to speak, free to wander, free to live. These were ideals worth risking everything for. Today, we find ourselves fighting old battles, not with past foes, but with ourselves. We are a nation divided, divided by skin, divided by opinion, divided by hate. It seems the very freedoms we once fought for have become stumbling blocks. Are we too busy seeking ourselves to even recognize the tragedy which surrounds us? Do we no longer see the profound need for the hand of God? In this moment, the truth of Scripture rings especially true. If we, the people, will humbly pray, turn from wickedness, and seek His face, then He will hear us, He will forgive us, and He will heal this land. Today, may we remember this one simple truth. True independence is found only in our dependence on God.